Greetings, BioNerdlings. Today we're going to be talking about examples of artificial selection, and then I'm going to be going into the modes of natural selection. Modes of natural selection are going to include some graphs. I want to make sure you guys draw examples of each type of mode of selection, there are only three, uh, in your notebook, because I guarantee you those will be on tests, and you really need to know the difference between the three types of selection. So we've already talked a little bit about natural selection and Darwin and how it's one of the major mechanisms of evolution. Today we're going to see some examples of artificial selection and I'm going to talk about some environmental um, issues that affect natural selection as well. So for example, we artificially select for characteristics of our beloved furry little friends all the time. We have taken genes and dogs and we've made pugs, we've made giant like bear-like dogs, we've made you know mastiffs, we've made German shepherds, and we've made teeny bitty chihuahuas, and we've made tiny little teacup chihuahuas. We made them super, super, super small, and super, super, super big. And that's all done through artificial selection, taking a trait that we like and continuing to breed individuals who have traits like that. We're not allowing natural selection to occur. We are artificially selecting genes we like and breeding those different types of genes, in this example, dogs, to get the traits that we want. And for us, those traits are their phenotypes. So another example of what happens when we artificially select is that we have a huge loss in diversity. So looking at this, we have a lot of loss in genetic diversity. This is, again, artificial selection within crop species. Could be sunflowers, which is what you see here, uh, corn, you hear a lot about, you know, Monsanto, and I'm not going to get onto that online, um, but it takes away a lot of genetic diversity and makes everything the same. So one of the problems with that is if everything's the same and something comes in and it affects it or it can kill that different, that organism, it will kill all of them. If we have some genetic diversity, it may only affect a portion of those organisms. So when we're artificially selecting for traits, we're, we're not letting natural selection occur. We are making it artificial. That's not what would have actually happened in nature. So natural selection, kind of a recap, is the only mechanism that consistently causes adaptive evolution. Evolution by natural selection is a blend of chance and sorting. Basically, chance in the context of mutations randomly occur, and it causes new genetic variations. Sorting in the context of that natural selection favors some alleles over others. So for example, you know, the monkey with the largest or the longest arms and the, you know, the longest tail, you know, can escape from predators easy, swing from branches easier, and so the ones with the longest arms and the longest tails are going to be able to breed and pass on their off, you know, their genes to their offspring and all of that. Um, favoring process causes the outcome of natural selection to be anything but random. It's selecting for individuals who are better adapted to that environment and selecting against individuals who are not suited for that environment. So natural selection consistently increases frequencies of alleles that provide reproductive advantage, and it leads to adaptive evolution. Basically, the opposite is artificial selection. We as humans are selecting for traits that we want, not what traits are best for that individual. So relative fitness, uh, there are animal species in which individuals, mostly the males of course, they'll lock horns, uh, they'll compete, they'll fight, they'll damage each other, uh, and they combat for mating privileges. So reproductive success is usually far more subtle. Um, relative fitness, however, is defined as the contribution an individual makes to the gene pool of the next generation relative to the contribu uh, contributions of other individuals. And like I said, we're going to discuss a lot more about sexual selection in a different podcast. So moving on to our three modes of natural selection. Take out a pen or a pencil and write these down. So natural selection can alter the frequency uh, distribution of heritable traits in three ways, depending on which phenotype is favored. We have directional selection, disruptive selection, and stabilizing selection. And you will need to know graphs for each, and you will need to be able to give examples of what is what based on, you know, a paragraph or something like that given to you. Read it, and is it, you know, directional? Is it disruptive? Is it stabilizing? 
So we're looking right here, this is our original population. These are the phenotypes of fur color in mice. We could have down here, you know, baby birth weights, you know, uh, finch beak types. So all of it could be down here. But for this purpose, we're going to use fur color as our phenotype, our phenotypic trait. So we have light mice, really dark mice. We kind of favor in the middle. So stabilizing selection is exactly what it sounds like. It stabilizes nice and in the middle. It removes the extreme variant, so it removes the very, very light mice and the very, very dark mice, and we wind up with medium brown mice. And the population, and it preserves intermediate types. It reduces variation, and it tends to maintain the status quo for a particular phenotypic character. So for example, it might be, you know, human height. All right, most females are between five foot four and five foot eight. Now we have females over here that, you know, are over six foot, and we have females over here that are, you know, under five feet. But the status quo is going to be in that middle range. Um, so right here, this is our original graph. Stabilizing selection, we're going to kind of scoop up in the middle. So stabilizing our original population, stabilizing. We're just taking that medium brown colored mouse. We've gotten rid of the white mice, we've gotten rid of the dark brown mice, and we're keeping that medium one. Now in directional selection, it's going to shift from one direction to the next. Might shift to super dark mice, it might shift to super light mice. So directional selection occurs when conditions favor individuals exhibiting one extreme of a phenotypic range. So it occurs when a population's environment changes or when members of a population migrate to a new or different habitat. Uh, one of the activities that you will have done or will do shortly is beak of the finch. When we look at statistical data and we look at, you know, the beaks that are normal and then a drought occurs and you see like a shift, a directional shift in the birds that actually have this odd phenotype, phenotypic beak are the ones that survive. So in this instance, maybe, you know, they move to a different environment. Maybe the scenery changes, there's a drought. And so, you know, everything gets darker, anything like that. So we have the original population and we have a directional shift. So now, instead of it being stabilizing and we have that nice little medium, it's going to shift in one direction. So now the mice that are dark colored are going to be favored by natural selection and those are the ones that are living and able to survive and pass on their genes to their offspring. So here's a possible effect of continual directional selection. If continued, the variance may decrease. So before, we have after, before, after, before, and then after is very, very small. So basically like only the darkest of the darkest of the dark mice will survive. So that's the shift. The next type of selection is disruptive or diversifying selection. Disruptive selection occurs when conditions favor individuals of both extremes, but not in the middle. So basically the super white mice and the super dark mice are the ones who are gonna live, but the ones of that medium brown color, not so lucky. So we have our original population, and then this would be our disruptive. So we have high population of our light colored mice, high population of the dark colored mice, and not so much in the middle. So those are the three types of natural selection. Make sure, like I said, you have all those graphs with a description of them in your notebooks because you will definitely see these on the exam. So environments change and they act as a selective uh, mechanism on populations. You hear a lot about global warming, global climate change right now, and that's affecting tons and tons of species here on Earth. Plants, animals, all of it. Um, the environment does not directly cause changes in the DNA, but it acts on the phenotypes that occur through random changes in DNA. So, you know, the climate changes and, you know, plant life dies out, so you have a lot more brown. So guess what? Now if you're brown, you're going to survive because you blend into your environment. But, you know, if you're a different color, maybe you're lighter, maybe you're going to be picked off now. So an example of the environment changing is going to be flowering time in relation to global climate change. So as our global temperature is increasing, it's going to affect the flowering of our plants. Uh, crop production is very sensitive to climate change, and the increase in temperature has a huge impact on the rate of plant development. So the warmer temperatures mean reduced crop yields. So basically all of the plants kind of flower really early, um, they don't 
they don't do as well when they're flowering early like that. So the earlier crop flowering and maturity have been observed and documented in the recent decades, and these are often associated with warmer spring temperatures. So another example is our peppered moth that we've already spoken about. Um, the light phenotype was favored before the Industrial Revolution because it blended into the tree bark. After the Industrial Revolution, the black moths were the ones that were favored because they blended into the tree bark. And as you can see here, the white moths, not so much. So again, we have our original population and then we have, bam, population after natural selection has occurred uh, with the Industrial Revolution. Well, I hope that was helpful. This is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.